back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here with consumer activist Ralph Nader, who not only has run for president three times, but has written a number of books and is well known for his advocacy work around the country and around the world. But in particular, we're going to be talking about Princeton 55, an initiative that was uh, initiated in part because of Ralph Nader. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming on. If you could say a word or two about Princeton 55 and, and how that came about, that would be great. Well, it came about because we, we would occasionally go back to reunions, uh, our classmates, and, uh, and uh, the, the process was basically to pander to us instead of to uh, engage our intelligence. They entertained us, they let us put tents up on the campus by class, and um, a lot of beer, a lot of music, and then they would ask us for money to contribute to the alumni fund for Princeton. Well, after a while, I thought this was rather depreciative of what they graduated each year, which was supposedly intelligent people. So we got together with maybe 10 of my classmates and we said, why don't we form a group that will uh, allow undergraduates and new graduates an opportunity uh, uh, to connect and work with a civic action group. It wasn't charity, it was gonna be a systemic action group, trying to solve the problems, prevent the problems uh, from the first get-go. In other words, uh, to advance justice, and not charity. And there is a clear distinction between charity ministering to very real needs like soup kitchens and justice, which say, why do we have to have soup kitchens if everybody uh, can have a decent livelihood? and get a living wage, for example. Well, it was amazing to watch. I mean, some of these classmates I haven't seen for 20, 30 years, and it just clicked, just like that. It was a, a, a meeting that followed a mini reunion of the class of 1955 at the Red Cross building in Washington. And we had 1950 cuisine, you know, roast beef and uh, all that. And uh, it, they had different members of Congress who were Princeton grads talking to them, Senator Paul Sarbanes, for example. And then I was wind up on a very rainy Saturday morning. And I looked out at my classmates and I said, what are we doing? What, I mean, why are we meeting? Uh, how do we, uh, as one classmate later put it, move from success to significance? And I, it, was just, it was just a sudden catalyst. And, then we met with a, a group of 10 uh, classmates and we started Princeton Project 55. And the idea was to place Princeton undergraduates in summer internships in civic action groups around the country and uh, fellowships after they graduated. Now we wouldn't fund this. We would try to get it funded by the various groups that we had on our list that wanted bright Princeton students. Uh, to, uh, to be in, in their uh, office uh, for uh, internships or possibly full-time jobs. And we became the biggest recruiter for civic action groups at Princeton. And when we had the big parade, when we came back for Alumni Weeky Week at Princeton, uh, as the various classes with their banners marched by, we got the biggest applause because the students had recognized what we did for them. And so we had an office on Nassau Street. And after a few years, uh, we got a call. And this was on our, th I think, 30th reunion that we started, Princeton Project 55. We got a call from uh, some uh, people who were uh, part of the internship and fellowship. Turns out they went to Silicon Valley. They made a little money. And they wanted to buy us a mansion for our headquarters. And they did, right off the campus. So we now have a mansion, headquarters. It's now called, uh, it's not called Pr Pr Princeton Project 55, it's called uh, Princeton Alumni Corps, because it's bringing in more classes now. And uh, I think we're staffed at up to eight or nine people. Well, well, first of all, congratulations on all of this. I think it's terrific. Uh, but I think it does raise an interesting question as to kind of what a university says and what a university does. Uh, and those aren't exactly the same all the time. 
Uh, and so would you have a thought or two about how more universities, perhaps without the resources of Princeton or without you know, your resources, um, what, what can more universities do to kind of bring out the activism of students who may care about things that perhaps the university per se may not care as much about? Well, uh, this was in the context of uh, the alumni class. I mean, I've always thought the alumni classes, 30 years and out, are a huge human resource for civic action. First of all, they've, they've known each other since they were 18 or 17. So they can be very, very candid with each other. Nobody has to, you know, uh, prance around and be phony. Second, they have all, almost all the skills needed for a citizen action project. There are lawyers, there are doctors, there are business people, there are accountants, there are graphic artists, there are public relations people, uh, scholars. And we had a class of 750, and we had all that uh, skill to tap into. And, and uh, so we then had conferences to diffuse the idea of an alumni class uh, turning itself into a 501c3 and becoming a civic action uh, entity. And we had conferences and we invited people from Dartmouth, Yale, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Oberlin, uh, various colleges and universities all over the country, not just Ivy League. And uh, one, one of these conferences was addressed by John Gardner, who started Common Cause and who was former Secretary of Health and Education uh, under Lyndon Johnson, and who wrote uh, this great book on leadership and also another book on self-renewal. And he was totally overwhelmed by the idea. Why? Because of the affinity group. Because how quickly we could get together and, and trust each other. Because we were a class and we had, had reunions over the years and we had many undergraduate memories. And we had a great uh, diversity, uh, of course at that time it was all male, but we had a diversity of talents and skills. And he said, don't dilute the class. Well, unfortunately, as the years passed, it was diluted into Princeton Alumni Corps. And so it tapped into many other subsequent classes of 1965, 1970, 1975, 1980. Not quite as intensive, not quite as passionate. Uh, we had a, a principal in, in Princeton 55 that if somebody proposed doing something other than scholarships and fellowships, we had our own projects. Like we wanted to do something on uh, energy, we wanted to do something on systemic mentoring and so on. And uh, anybody who proposed something, uh, they had to passionately pursue it. They just didn't throw it on the table and say, see you later. So we had that idea. Now, just think of the thousands of alumni classes, public, private universities and colleges that are 30 years out. That's when they sort of hit the ceiling of how high they're gonna go in their company or law firm uh, or uh, university. And so that's when they turn around and this slogan, moving from success to significance, kicks in. And I thought with the conferences that we had, uh, the A, there would be foundation money for this. I mean, it's like motherhood and apple pie, right? It's a whole new human resource alumni classes. And I thought that the people who came from alumni uh, of other universities and colleges would say, wow, we can do this. There's nothing special about Princeton Project 55. I was wrong. I was wrong because although we got Dartmouth to set up some project for scholarships or Yale set up something, it was never the full menu that Princeton Project 55 had, never a fully staffed operation. And it's because none of them ever got the critical mass of about a dozen people. It, it, there'd be two in Yale, or one or two in Dartmouth. It's not enough. We tried to get to Project 55 at Harvard, I went to their reunion. It was not enough. We never could find 12 dedicated people who confronted the obstacles, confronted the discouragement, got the legal papers together, um, talked to the administration, which often was jealous because they thought we're gonna siphon money away from their alumni funds. Turns out it increased the money because a lot of alumni were turned off as most alumni do. They're not all active and writing checks. But then members of our class said, hey, you know, we're really doing something here. Uh, and so they became even more supportive. So it does take a dozen. We can never get a dozen. So. 
we actually paid one of my class members to leave his Wall Street brokerage firm, Chet Safian, and work full time on diffusion. He traveled all over the country. He went to Morehouse College. He went to Oberlin. He went to Swarthmore. He met with the top people, with the alumni directors and so on. And, and all he got was, well, this is a wonderful idea. Thank you, Mr. Safian. But it never clicked. So I leave it to people watching this program to pick up, pick up on it and make it click. Because you could have thousands of civic groups. You know, some of them may want to focus on housing. Some of them may focus on intellectual property or on biotech or on climate disruption. Uh, you know, and just think of the resource, tens of thousands of people working together with full-time staff. Think of the arm around the shoulder of the younger generation. Think of the mentoring by action, learning by doing, uh, that they would extend to thousands of graduates who today say, we want to improve our country and world. We don't know how. Well, this is the way to know how. Well, that's a really interesting challenge, and hopefully viewers will pick up on that challenge, and current students will uh, pick up on that challenge as well. In terms of current students, um, obviously, this generation of student is very different from a generation five years ago and 10 years ago and 15 and 20 years ago and so forth and so on. Could you say a word or two about what motivated your generation of, of students in college and how you see that different or similar to current students? Well, our generation of students were confronted by door opening justice movements, door opening to African Americans, to Hispanics, uh, to women, uh, that is a very exciting thing for students, you know, to break through those iron curtains, those uh, blockages of human opportunity and fulfillment of human possibilities. So that meant that there were opportunities to go down south and fight the civil rights struggle. And they come back, some of them were uh, mistreated by sheriffs and dogs, and some of them were arrested, and some of them saw how African-American civil rights, peaceful marches were disrupted. That's a huge motivator. The second was the Vietnam War. There's an old saying in the 60s, if you're part of the risk, you're part of the solution, the draft. And they couldn't turn their back the way young people did on the, the slaughter and sociocide of Iraq and the uh, dissolution of uh, uh, Afghanistan because they were never gonna be drafted. It was largely 5% of the American population, the soldiers and the families who were engaged. However, they, because they knew they could go to Vietnam and they couldn't all get deferments, uh, they joined the anti-war movement. That means they learned how to march, demonstrate, nonviolent civil disobedience, all the various street tools of democracy. That was another motivator. A third was the women's rights movement. That was clearly another uh, motivator. And I think above all, the media gave coverage to this. The media is excluding civic groups right and left, local, state, national, like never before. They're into sensational stuff. They're into uh, covering people who insult each other. Um, they're into features to get Pulitzer Prizes or other prizes. They don't cover citizen movements unless there's real disruption. It's a terrible thing. You know, you're telling young people they have to turn over cars or in the street in order to get coverage. But in the 60s, they got a lot of coverage. And they got on the Phil Donahue show. They got even on sometimes the Merv Griffin and the Mike Douglas show. These are largely entertainment shows, but they felt some pressure from the Federal Communications Commission to put on, sometimes for the first time before 10 million people, these young civic leaders. And Phil Donahue was a special. Uh, person. He was the greatest enabler and practitioner of the First Amendment in the 20th century, in my judgment. So you don't have that anymore. You have these mawkish type sadist, masochistic afternoon network TV shows during weekdays. It's just horrible. You can't get on on any serious topic. And even NPR and PBS have diluted their uh, uh, journalistic courage in that respect. So those are some of the uh, uh, some of the reasons, we had a better Congress. That's another reason. Uh, it wasn't that much of a corporate Congress today. So there were public hearings, which got a lot of coverage. Now, 
uh, unfortunately, young people don't have that much to work with. That's why they're always saying, what, c what can we do? How, how can we do it? They don't have civic skills in their courses. High school, college, they don't learn about reality. They often learn about myths or occupational techniques, vocational education. But to learn about the law of wrongful injury, law of torts, starting with bullying, street crime, all the way up with toxic chemicals, air, water, pollution, hospital malpractice, they never learn anything about it. That's one of the great tools of democracy in our country. They don't learn about freedom of contract and all these fine print contracts that we sign and give away our rights to the big vendors, the insurance companies, banks, uh, the auto dealers, you name it. So we're reaping the bitter fruit of neglect here. And, uh, and I put a lot of responsibility on ordinary people because in our history, and what we like about this country, there are very ordinary people in the 18th, 19th, early 20th century who became extraordinary people and gave us the blessings of liberty and justice that we are not adequately renewing and defending. But I, I wonder if, if some college students might say, well, with all due respect, Mr. Nader, uh, climate change is a really big issue that's affecting the entire planet. And we as, a, as, we, as co we as college students are doing quite a bit in terms of organizing about that. H how might you respond to that? There are to always that? exceptions to all generalizations. And, and we have met uh, some of these students. And they come out of uh, sometimes uh, terrible tragedies. Uh, they come out of uh, intellectual awareness like climate disruption, if not storm fires in California. Uh, they are a very, very small minority of the students. The students today, in contrast to the 60s, are terrified not getting a good job. They're terrified they're not going to have good income security. In the 60s, they, they were much easier to get jobs. Uh, and uh, the pay was actually uh, better, relatively speaking, adjusted for inflation. And that's why they, they felt more uh, risk averse when they were students. Right now, the students feel they're going to be in some computer uh, uh, dossier uh, that, that I've had students tell me, I, I don't want to speak out because then when I want to get a job, they're going to go into my Facebook account or whatever, and, uh, and I won't know why I'm turned down even. So that's what invasion of privacy does. And the students today are having their privacy massively invaded and they're not fighting back enough. Uh, they're giving too much personal information away to Facebook and Google and Instagram and, and, and so forth. So while they are some active students, we could not assemble the quality and number of students today that we assembled in the 1960s and early 70s to investigate agencies in the federal government or companies like uh, DuPont in Delaware uh, or uh, the uh, paper mill companies in Maine. Uh, we just can't find them. Well, if I can follow up on that a little yeah. bit, in terms of journalism students, uh, as you know, journalism students pride themselves in, in doing this kind of investigative work, uh, to, you know, not exactly with the consumer angle that, that you're known for, but it's somewhat related. Uh, what advice would you have for journalism students who are studying right now? Well, I mean, keep at what you're doing, but the problem is the jobs are shrinking like crazy in journalism. In fact, uh, the salaries are shrinking. I just read the Columbia Journalism Review uh, full issue on journalism, and I think they said the average wage of a print journalist in the U.S. today is about $40,000 a year. That's, that includes seasoned journalists that bring up the average. So it's a terrible time for journalists. And when they do get a job, they're, they're told to keep posting things during the day of relative insignificance, uh, try to get 20 minutes ahead of the competition in terms of some normal news, uh, news break. Uh, and they don't even have time to reflect during the day for the major story, let's say, that they're writing for next morning newspaper. It's not a good time for young journalists. Now, there are some nonprofit groups that have started, ProPublico, for example, Center for Public Integrity, and then there's some local versions of that. Uh, but they need to grow very quickly to, to make up the slack. 
Well, what about the issue of the humanities? Some people argue that students are not taking enough humanities courses and therefore that's coloring judgments that lots of students have. That's very true. There's an infatuation with STEM, uh, with science, technology, mathematics, engineering, which is okay, but the problem is it's coming at the expense of shrinking the social studies budget. Social studies teachers have told me that they're not paid enough respect, uh, their bu budgets are shrinking, um, students uh, are not going to these courses as much because the hype is on, you gotta have a technical skill, you see, technical, not ethics, not humane values, not principles of justice, not strategies of civic action or civic skills. And, uh, and that's a very serious problem all over the country. The one word to describe social study teachers, they're demoralized. That's a bad message for our democracy. Well, and if we could get to the issue of democracy and civics, perhaps. Um, could you say a word or two about some of the courses that you took either in high school or in college? And I realize, you know, obviously you ran for president a number of times, but if you could think back to some of those early courses in high school or college, I think that might be interesting for viewers, especially those who are thinking about civics or government or public policy in some way. Well, first of all, I was just told by a famous historian that history courses are declining in high schools. American history courses, imagine that. Um, Civics courses, uh, they've been, you know, folded into some other uh, subject matter. Uh, they don't learn uh, how to write a press release. They don't learn uh, how to investigate City Hall. They don't learn how to uh, uh, be resilient, not be discouraged. Uh, they don't even read books anymore on the history of civic action and all the heroes throughout our countries. Uh, who stood up and, and, and uh, st stood tall and talked up, you know, and they held up our democratic institutions. Uh, and we're trying to get, uh, and we have a um, American Museum of Tort Law, it's the only law museum of any kind in the world, it's in Winstead, Connecticut, tortmuseum.org, and we're, developed, we're developing a high school curriculum on the law of wrongful injury and trial by jury. Seventh Amendment, the Constitution. Learn this law to defend yourself. Learn this law to see how it can deter companies from producing dangerous automobiles or releasing toxic chemicals or uh, incompetence in medical care. Um, learn about it. Uh, take some museums to do this. See, the, the structure that surrounds our high schools, colleges, universities, is a very commercial structure. They're full of people with, with what I call monetized minds. And they think the humanities and the social studies are sort of luxuries. Now you talk to some smart CEOs in this country and, and they prefer an English major. They can always teach them the technical stuff, the computer stuff. They prefer people who can conceptualize, who have some sense of what philosophy is and what history is, and who can write the English language. Um, and that message is not getting through enough uh, to people in our high schools and, uh, and, and colleges and universities. What they hear are STEM, STEM. What they hear are you know, computer coding, uh, computer science. And uh, it's not that they have to do one or the other. You've run for president a number of times. Is there anything that you regret in retrospect? Yeah, not winning. <laughs> but I didn't have any uh, illusions about a third party win. I believe that everybody has an equal right to run for election. So everybody has an equal right to get votes from one another. So no one person is a spoiler. Either we're all spoilers of each other or none of us are spoilers. To say a third party candidate, whether it's Green, Libertarian, whatever, is a spoiler, I think is a politically bigoted word. It should be abolished, and the press keeps, you know, running it back and forth. I mean, 95% of the time I was interviewed by the press, they were just interested. How do you feel being a spoiler? I said, a spoiler? I said, I'm I'm running against the most spoiled political system in our lifetime, and you're calling me a reformer, a spoiler? 
You see, so the press has serious responsibility here to clear their mind and see the great role that third parties have played in American history, starting with the Liberty Anti-Slavery Party in 1840, and then the Women's Suffrage Party, and then the Labor, Farmer, Progressive Parties. I say to some of these two-party loyalists, I say, aren't you glad s some people uh, went away from the Whigs and the Democratic Party in the early 19th century and voted for the Liberty Party against slavery? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Well, need I say more? Well, before we say goodbye, in terms of saying more, is there anything that you would like to encourage students and professors who, who will probably be watching this not only now, but also a little bit in the future, what do you want them to, to do? I want them to elaborate civic skill and participation courses. Connecting the classroom with the community There's a lot to study about our democracy, right where people live, from city hall to the environment, from the drinking water systems to the town halls or city councils, from the property tax system to what they use to pave the roads with or repair the roads with. And, uh, and that will really motivate the students. Uh, they will be very, very excited. Uh, they won't be bored. It will certainly elevate them in the eyes of their teachers and both of them will come out better. And some of it will be controversial and it might upset some of the local powers that be uh, or the Board of Education. But that's what the civic community outside is for, is to support them and to say to people who want to suppress this kind of civic uh, skill and participation, don't you want to turn out good citizens? Isn't this what our country needs? Well, you alluded to that being a little controversial. Yeah. Uh, how would you deal with someone who says, well, my parents don't want me to be so controversial? Well, it has to be dealt on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, some of the things the students may uh, be uh, educated to do may be not controversial at all for most people, like testing in their chemistry lab the drinking water, f protocols for heavy metals, you know, arsenic, cadmium, lead. And then they put out a report. I think the vast majority of the people would like that. The same, say, with testing soils or, or, or uh, uh, here's my favorite, doing a profile of your legislator, either state legislator or your two senators and representative. And you call up and you get interviews. I mean, you'll get very special treatment when the politicians in Washington know that you're going to put out a report on how they vote, when they vote, what they do in committee, who funds their campaigns, how they handle constituent responses. Because now the students don't just have to have a press conference, they can put it online. And that, that way they learn how to build democratic power by sheer knowledge, the accumulation of sheer knowledge. Now that's not gonna sit well with some retrograde politicians, they'll make the calls you know, to the <laughs> Board of Education. But we've got to free educational institutions from these kinds of crass uh, backdoor uh, arm twisting maneuvers and the only way we're going to do it is to test them challenge them well fair enough mr nader ralph nader thank you so much for coming on the show today well thank you and if you want more of what you've heard go to nader.org and you'll get free electronically every week my column seven minutes of agitation well thank you mr nader and uh, Mr. Nader just mentioned his website, and if you would like to send an email to, uh, to me to talk about the show, please do so at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.